So welcome. Uh, Tanasis Virgulis uh, uh, will uh, uh, introduce today the topic. Uh, Tanasis uh, is uh, our uh, develop development and operational uh, uh, director of uh, uh, OpenAir. And uh, uh, he's a computer scientist uh, working in uh, Athena Research Center. Uh, and today uh, is uh, presenting uh, uh, the open air graph, uh, an open research infrastructures for analysis. Uh, so, Tanasis, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julia, uh, for the introduction. I hope that you can hear me well. Okay, so let me also share my screen and go to presentation mode. Okay, I think that now everything is uh, set up. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, invitation to talk about this uh, today. Uh, as uh, Julia mentioned, uh, I have a role in the uh, in, in OpenAir as the Development Operations Director. Uh, but I am also a researcher in computer science in Athena, at Athena Research Center. Uh, so today uh, I will try to uh, present you uh, the ways uh, that uh, the opener graph can be useful uh, for people that uh, would like to uh, analyze uh, research data. And uh, as you will see in my presentation, there are uh, a lot of different uh, types of uh, uh, users for these uh, particular uh, use cases. There are a lot of different use cases out there, not only researchers that they would like to study a phenomenon uh, related uh, to the uh, research production, uh, but also other stakeholders. Okay, so uh, I will try to first uh, set up the um, uh, background uh, to provide some background uh, before going uh, uh, in the discussion uh, regarding the graph. Um, so I think that uh, most people that are involved uh, in uh, research activities, uh, they can agree uh, that uh, in the recent years, uh, we are experiencing a significant increase uh, in the volume of uh, the produced research output. And I'm not talking only about uh, publications, uh, which, as we know, are the most uh, widely known outputs of scientific research, uh, but also other types of contributions. Uh, researchers are performing uh, a, a wide uh, variety of different activities that are related to research, and uh, all these are uh, producing different uh, types of outputs. Some indicative examples, uh, data uh, that can be raw, uh, or processed uh, and structured uh, software, research software that can be used uh, from researchers to analyze data and uh, uh, get useful insights uh, or to reveal some hidden knowledge. Uh, presentations that are trying to, to provide uh, uh, more, informations, more information about uh, uh, particular uh, research activities. And of course, great literature, uh, which uh, includes uh, project deliverables, white papers, and uh, other similar um, resources. Uh, and this increase is indeed significant uh, because of uh, various, re various reasons. Uh, of course, uh, the domain uh, of uh, scientific publishing uh, uh, ha has um, become significantly larger. The number of uh, journals that uh, are currently available are significantly larger than before. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, more research institutions and researchers out there working on different uh, domains. Uh, we have also this uh, culture, uh, the notorious uh, publisher or, or Paris culture that uh, applies a lot of pressure on researchers to publish more. 
uh, so uh, the scientific output, uh, the result is that uh, we are experiencing a, a large increase uh, in the uh, volume of the scientific output. Uh, of course, this um, uh, creates some uh, uh, challenges uh, on how to manage uh, all these data and metadata uh, in a way that uh, um, someone could uh, um, use this uh, huge amount of information out there. Uh, but uh, it is also an opportunity, of course, as you can understand, uh, for uh, the the people for for people to analyze uh, all this data, this variety, uh, this wide variety of data, and get useful insights uh, for informed decisions, uh, or to just study interesting uh, phenomena uh, in the scientific publishing domain. But of course, this is in theory, uh, because uh, when someone was trying. Uh, to perform a kind of analysis like this in the past, uh, the first uh, impediment uh, that uh, they, they would experience would be uh, the paywalls. Uh, so, okay, uh, researchers are producing a lot of different outputs. Uh, useful knowledge uh, is included there. Uh, but until recently, uh, the most uh, scholarly data and metadata uh, were confined uh, within uh, the scientific publisher's data silos. Uh, so only uh, those that uh, were paying uh, for access uh, for this data and metadata uh, could make use of the respective data sets. Um, this was a phenomenon that, uh, of course, prohibited the exploitation of this data and uh, all the opportunities and the potential uh, for uh, analyzing them uh, to get these insights that we mentioned. Um, this was uh, sl uh, essentially slowing down <clears throat> the advancements uh, in fields like uh, scientometrics, which is a field that is trying uh, to analyze uh, the outputs of research. And uh, also, uh, it was um, uh, resulting in non-negligible costs and a waste of resources uh, for research performing or research funding organizations and other uh, stakeholders that uh, were interested uh, in a similar type of analysis. Um, and of course, another important problem uh, was that uh, this situation was also hindering hindering the transparency of research and uh, reproducibility, uh, which is uh, one of the core uh, of the corning stones uh, of uh, scientific integrity. And it is considered to be uh, specific, uh, specifically important, especially during an era uh, where, as we said, uh, the scientific output uh, the volume of the scientific output is uh, becoming larger and lar larger. Um, but then uh, something uh, started to change. And we are experiencing this change uh, during the last uh, years. Of course, uh, in uh, two words, uh, the change uh, that we are experiencing is open science. Uh, so, uh, open science and all the relative initiatives uh, that are derived uh, from this uh, movement, like, for instance, the initiative for open citations or the initiative for open abstracts, uh, starting to, uh, started to improve uh, the situation. Uh, if you don't know about these two initiatives, the one uh, is advocating uh, to make uh, citations citation metadata uh, available to everyone, to be openly available. Uh, and uh, the second one uh, is a similar uh, initiative uh, for abstracts of research papers. So in the previous year, we started experiencing a kind of change. Uh, there was uh, some interest and some popularity uh, around initiatives like this uh, that were advocating 
uh, in favor of uh, making a lot of metadata publicly available uh, so that everyone uh, could use them uh, to for analysis purposes. And uh, it was not um, uh, after a lot of time uh, that we experienced uh, the results uh, of these initiatives and of the open science movement in general. Uh, all these uh, um, initiatives uh, succeeded uh, in creating uh, a cultural change uh, that enabled, catalyzed uh, the creation of a lot of different uh, open research resources, or as I name them here, open science graphs, uh, which are uh, scholarly uh, data um, sources uh, that include useful information about uh, research outputs and related entities like researchers, uh, funding uh, organizations and so on. Uh, so you can see here on the slide just an indicative uh, list uh, of uh, different uh, open science resources, open research data resources like open citations, data site, uh, Lens, Microsoft Academic Graph, Dimensions, Semantic Scholar, Open Alex, PubMed and so on. And of course, the Opener Graph. Uh, on which uh, we are going to focus uh, for the rest of uh, the presentation because uh, it is one of the largest uh, collections out there for uh, open research data and uh, the de facto uh, graph uh, for EOSC uh, that contains uh, uh, research information um, around EOSC. Um, so, since all these uh, resources became available, like the Opener Graph, that contain uh, very rich information that can be valuable uh, for analyzing research data. Uh, so, uh, it, it was a matter of time for people to start thinking, okay, so we now have all these resources. Um, should we use them? Uh, should we try to use them instead instead of uh, uh, the restricted uh, sources like Web of Science, for instance, or Scopus to perform our type of analysis, for instance, scientometrics sci uh, analysis. Um, especially in 2023, I think that a lot happened uh, towards this direction. And this discussion was very active. As an indicative example, uh, here there is a typo, it is ISSI 2023, not 24. Uh, in ISSI uh, 2023, 20, uh, uh, which, which was uh, the International Conference uh, of the International Society for Scientometrics and Infometrics, uh, I had uh, uh, the pleasure to, to have a joint presentation for a tutorial, a relevant tutorial with Andrea Manocchi uh, from uh, CNR. Uh, about transitioning towards open scientometrics using and exploiting open science graphs. So this was a very interesting tutorial having two parts. The first one was a, an introduction in the field of open science graphs. Uh, and the second one was a hands-on uh, session uh, in, in, in involving uh, simple scientometrics tasks uh, using the opener graph showcasing uh, how someone could uh, uh, perform simple scientometric tasks using the opener graph. If you are interested, you can uh, find more information in, on this slide and all the slides of this uh, presentation are available uh, on Zenodo. Uh, but the important thing to mention uh, regarding this is that uh, this was just an indicative uh, uh, case uh, where this discussion about uh, moving uh, towards um, the open research sources to use for scientometrics and other types of related analysis uh, was happening in 2023. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm sure that you have uh, heard uh, pieces of this discussion in other places. You have heard about organizations starting uh, stopping uh, their subscriptions to Web of Science or um, similar uh, services and uh, uh, advocating uh, on um, uh, the usage of on the use of 
uh, open uh, sources instead. Now, the previous years, this was not uh, an option. Why? Uh, first of all, one problem, one related problem was the coverage of all these sources. But recent, recent uh, studies have shown that now uh, the open resources uh, are uh, very close in terms of coverage to the closed ones. And other uh, possible uh, issues um, are related uh, to the quality of the data that are included in the open science graphs. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of activities regarding that. I think that in the first uh, community call uh, made by Paolo, uh, it was mentioned that, uh, uh, for instance, in open air, uh, we have uh, uh, a line of work involving various activities that we are trying to to improve uh, the quality of the data uh, inside uh, the graph. Uh, but in general, the situation in 2023 uh, started to be very good uh, and even uh, before that. And uh, this is why a lot of people started thinking of uh, ab abandoning uh, the uh, cloud so sources uh, in favor of using uh, the open ones like the opener graph. And to be honest, I would like to speak about that because also the timing. Uh, so yesterday, uh, on April uh, 16th, uh, it was officially announced the Barcelona Declaration on Open Research Information. So this is an initiative uh, focusing on this specific problem. Uh, the problem that uh, at this point we feel like uh, there is no... A significant reason why not to use open research uh, infrastructures and open research um, resources instead of closed ones. Uh, so maybe you have seen uh, the various posts and uh, tweets about that yesterday because uh, this was the official launch. Uh, this declaration has been uh, has been signed uh, already by the, by a lot of organizations. And the organizations, the research performing or uh, research funding organizations that have signed it, they are committing uh, to some simple uh, things, like, for instance, uh, to make openness the default for uh, research information and metadata, uh, to, uh, to help and support um, systems and services uh, that are offering open research information uh, to support the sustainability of the respective uh, infrastructures and uh, to also uh, support collective actions uh, to accelerate uh, the transition to openness uh, of research information, uh, leaving behind uh, closed uh, uh, options. Uh, like those that were uh, ha have been used uh, in the past. If you are interested uh, in this declaration, maybe also signing it as an organization, you can follow the link from this slide uh, to the website that was officially launched yesterday. And here I have included uh, the different uh, um, the highlights, uh, if we consider the reasons why an organization would like to sign uh, the Barcelona Declaration uh, because fair assessment of researchers and institutions requires, requires transparency. Uh, so this is why we should use open data instead of closed ones because equitable uh, decision making requires inclusive data. And uh, as you know, uh, the open uh, research uh, data sources uh, are uh, pretty inclusive, are trying to uh, have uh, mechanisms to collect uh, as much content as possible. And of course, because uh, open science requires open re research information, it is very important to have uh, resources and infrastructures that are offering uh, open research information and metadata so that open science uh, can happen in any case. As I said, uh, 40, about 45 uh, um, fo foundational signatories uh, are uh, already um, there, and most of them are research performing or research funding organizations. 
And then um, there are also 15 supporters, uh, which are organizations that are providing data, services, or infrastructure that can be used uh, in this uh, mission. And of course, as you can imagine, Open Air uh, is one of them. Okay, so uh, based on all this, you can understand that there is a momentum and uh, a, a cultural change regarding that. Uh, it seems like this is the situation right now. We all understand, and if you talk with people in this domain, uh, you will see that they all agree uh, that from now on, people should invest more on open research uh, infrastructures and resources. Um, so, um, one of them uh, is the Open Air Graph, and not just one of them, as I explained, one of the largest, more inclusive, and of course the de facto uh, uh, research uh, metadata graph that is used by EOSC. Um, so what is the Open Air Graph? I'm sure that for those of you that have um, uh, participated in the previous uh, community calls, you already know uh, which are the main contents uh, that you can find in the graph. Uh, of course, uh, the most important entity that is covered is the, this of uh, the research products. And we, when we are talking about research products, we are talking about publications, data set software, but also other types of contributions, like those that I have presented in the first slide. You can find uh, a lot of uh, such entities represented in the graph, more than 100 than 175 million publications right now, more than, than 59 million data sets and more than um, uh, 360K of uh, software packages that uh, are related to research. Um, you can find useful metadata for them like uh, persistent identifiers, like citations, fields of science, uh, uh, connections to to sustainability develop sustainable sustainable development goals and a lot uh, of other things uh, but you can also find connections of the research projects uh, the research products to uh, funds grants projects we have more than three million of them in the graph already uh, people uh, so uh, we have, uh, based on the authorship connection, a uh, connection of uh, researcher to the research products and other entities, the data sources that someone could use uh, to, uh, to get this type of metadata, uh, organizations uh, for which we also have bids like uh, their own identifiers, and other metadata like the countries from where they come, and communities uh, that uh, research... Uh, groups of researchers like uh, uh, people participating in research infrastructure or in a particular project or domain can, can create their own community and connect um, research products and uh, grants uh, to this community. Uh, okay, so this is what you can find more or less in the opener graph, why the opener graph matters in any case. It matters because it is an open and global map of science. It tries to be an open and global map of science. And what do we mean with that? We mean that the opener graph is trying to cover not only publications, as uh, most of the um, uh, other initiatives out there are trying to do, uh, but to cover uh, a lot of uh, types of uh, research outputs and activities uh, that are currently overlooked, like dataset, software, projects, maybe peer reviews, uh, project deliverables, and all uh, other things. So the Open Air Graph uh, is housing and meticulously uh, representing uh, all these type of contributions and activities, something that you cannot easily find in another uh, data source. Uh, also, the Open Air Graph is inclusive and is trying to contain content from different disciplines. It's not specifically focused on a particular discipline. Uh, for instance, ICT's PubMed, uh, 
uh, it's trying to, to cover all disciplines, but also all languages. In some of the disciplines, uh, this is very important because a lot of the research work that people are doing is published uh, in different languages than English. We have a lot of text in Spanish, in French, and in languages like that uh, for particular domains that the researchers um, are used to uh, publish in their uh, mother tongue. Uh, also, uh, in Opener Graph, in the Opener Graph, you can find open science material uh, from institutional repositories and similar sources like, for instance, um, open science journals, etc., that you cannot find uh, elsewhere. Uh, so uh, these uh, resources uh, are available because uh, Open Air has on board a lot of different uh, open <clears throat> science-related uh, data sources. And this is an impor important uh, thing to, to know uh, that a lot of the content that you can find in the graph because of that, you cannot find it elsewhere. <clears throat> Finally, it is completely open and transparent. It is based and built on open data. Uh, it is uh, using open sources. And of course, its production is completely transparent. You can find details about how every a piece of information is produced in the documentation side of the graph. Uh, and then in the respective uh, publications that uh, we publish uh, from time to time. Uh, another important thing that uh, makes the graph unique uh, is that it is trying to follow the community standards for interoperability. Uh, so uh, a lot of effort is, is given uh, so that we can make it easier for people to consume data from our graph and also combine them uh, with data from other similar graphs or, for example, for domain-specific knowledge bases. Uh, there is an ongoing effort regarding that to support uh, the SKGIF model that is being produced by a working group, an interest group uh, of RDA, the Research Data Alliance, but also uh, for relevant specifications. Now, something that I would like to, to clarify, uh, because uh, in many cases, when I'm talking with people that are not very familiar with uh, the contents of the opener graph, they have this uh, misconception in mind. Uh, so, although opener's main mission is to promote open science and, of course, make the respective uh, content uh, easily accessible. Uh, this does not mean that uh, the Opener Graph contains only open research. Uh, the Opener Graph, as you can see in the right of this slide, uh, although it focuses on making sure that uh, the open science initiatives uh, are considered and included in the graph, uh, it is also uh, incorporating data and metadata from other sources, like, for instance, the Crossref, uh, Microsoft Academic, Data Site, etc., that are not only covering uh, open science and open research. So, in the opener graph, you can also find uh, research that is closed, that is restric of restric restricted access. Uh, opener graph, the opener graph is collecting metadata for everything. And this is something important that sometimes people do not um, have in mind. So for someone that would like to perform any kind of analysis, uh, this analysis will not be restricted considering only open science uh, content. And of course, open air on top of that is providing some added value, some important added value. You can see the variety of different sources that are being used on this slide uh, that are being used for the production of the graph. And as you can understand, as you can assume, uh, a lot of these are providing uh, content that is uh, overlapping, that have redundancies. Uh, Opener is collecting everything for, for, from all these sources and is performing a very difficult uh, task of the aggregating, the duplicate, and the duplicating uh, the respective information. This is very important. 
as we will see also uh, later on in this presentation. But this deduplication and aggregation is also happening, making sure that the provenance of information remains so that someone could uh, delve into the details and see from which source each piece of information was produced and if needed uh, to even uh, disregard uh, part of the information from a source that they do not uh, trust uh, that much. So the duplication and provenance are the norm in the open air graph and this is an important added value. Moving back to the main subject of the today presentation, uh, which is uh, the analysis that someone could do with this uh, graph. And more specifically, focusing on scientometrics. Uh, what someone can find in the open air graph? They can find basic metadata for research projects. Uh, of course, the title, the publication date, the venue and all these that are important, but also things like the access right of uh, the respective research product. Is it open? Is it in embargo? Uh, all these uh, are included in the respective uh, metadata that we keep for research products. Uh, also, someone can find citations that come for, from multi multiple sources, from Crossref, from Open Citations, from Microsoft Academic Graph, uh, the last version of, the, of it be, before discontinued. And being discontinued, uh, etc. There are also other citations that uh, are being extracted uh, from text mining algorithms that OpenAir is performing on open access uh, publications directly. And the important thing about citations is that these citations are deduplicated. Just because OpenAir has a deduplication algorithm to make sure that multiple versions of the same product are grouped together in one entry. Uh, just because of that, then uh, we are also able to produce a unique set of citations, uh, removing any duplicates. So when someone is using citations, and if they are using them as a proxy for instance of uh, scientific impact, that is a very common use. Uh, if you don't do the, the duplication, uh, there is a problem uh, because uh, the same publication that uh, has been in multiple versions, for, for instance, a pre-printed, uh, finally uh, published version of the, um, on, an, on the journal, uh, each citation to a particular other publication will count twice or multiple times. So in OpenAir, we deduplicate both articles, but also the citations. And this is an important improvement, making sure that citations from multiple versions of the same paper count only once. Uh, also, I have included here a blog post from Ludo Waltman that I'm sure that many of you uh, know him uh, about uh, uh, the particularities that are introduced uh, to the bibliographic databases because of the existence of preprints, more or less the versions, the multiple versions of the papers. And if you go there and follow the link, you will see that uh, there are some important features that the bibliographic databases uh, should, uh, should have uh, to avoid uh, some well-known problems. And you will see that for those sources that were covered in this particular uh, blog post, uh, like I think Web of Science, European C and uh, various others, no one uh, is offering uh, this the duplication and citations, although it has been identified by the article as an important uh, condition. And OpenAir is providing this. I think this is very important. Now, moving away from citations, the OpenAir graph also contains uh, some pre-cooked, let's, let's call them like this, uh, indicators. So each entry of uh, a scientific uh, research product uh, it has a calculated citation-based impact indicator, a set of uh, scientific-based, uh, uh, citation-based uh, impact indicators like citation count, influence and popularity. Uh, we get these uh, scores uh, from a database that uh, is calculating this type of uh, indicators, uh, which is called BIP, BIP services. And then, of course, we also have uh, indicators of the usage of the research product. Uh, in terms of downloads and views, uh, there is a, 
relevant uh, service of open air that is called uh, usage counts and uh, it calculates uh, this type of uh, indicators for uh, the various research products and these indicators are, are also incorporated inside the graph so someone that downloads the graph or uses the apis have uh, has direct access to all these pre-cooked indicators without the need to calculate something like this um, everything is ready um, there are also very interesting connections to the fields of science of the publications the fos but also to the sustainable development goals if a publication is related to one particular goal in SDGs, uh, Open Air Graph provides uh, this type of connections. Also connections to research funding and specific grants, so uh, which was the project uh, that has funded a particular publication, uh, but also connections to affiliated organizations and even countries. So all these are very useful pieces of information for someone that is analyzing uh, a research domain, for instance, or trying to perform a scientometrics analysis. And speaking of that, um, an indicative set of examples, but of course you can imagine others. Uh, someone could uh, use this data to perform longitudinal studies on research production, uh, to perform a domain analysis for a particular scientific domain, uh, to analyze a particular field of uh, interest, uh, to see how many publications or data sets are related to this field, uh, to perform an impact analysis based on citations for particular grants or organizations, to produce institutional reports, for example, like the annual reports uh, that organizations, research performing or organizations are, are producing each year. Um, to perform a trend identification analysis for different topics, for emerging topics, for instance, or uh, to monitor the open science uptake. And of course, as I said, these are indicative examples. You can uh, imagine that based on this variety of data, you can also uh, find other ways to, to exploit them. How someone could access the graph? Uh, there are two many ways. Uh, the first one is uh, downloading our full data set. I have included the links in this slide so that uh, I can help you find uh, all the information. Uh, so we have a data set, it's pretty large. Uh, so to analyze it, uh, you, you will need to have access to a very powerful machine or cluster uh, so that you can uh, perform analysis on that. Uh, but all the data that we are providing in this full data set are open. Uh, also, we have some APIs, and the main API uh, that we are providing is the search API, uh, which is providing uh, some nice ways uh, to download useful information, useful content uh, contents from the graph. Um, keep in mind that uh, we are currently at the process of updating uh, this search API, the main API of the graph, uh, to make it keep to making it easier to use, uh, to simplify, for instance, the responses and to extend it uh, to cover missing uh, pieces of information based on the experience that we had uh, with some of the users uh, we have approached in the past. And of course, someone that would like to get the data of the graph and start, start working on them, uh, there, there is a wide range of uh, supporting material to help them uh, become familiar uh, with uh, this resource. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you have seen in the previous uh, community call, uh, you have um, uh, heard uh, Miriam presenting the beginner's kit of the Open Air Graph, uh, that is a smaller version of uh, the full data set that can be more easily handled uh, by a local machine. Uh, so someone could use this to become more familiar with the graph uh, data model. Uh, there is a full uh, documentation website uh, that you can search even using keyword-based search uh, to find the information that uh, you would like to know more about. Uh, and uh, finally, last but not least, uh, we have a user forum and uh, our intention is to build uh, uh, a community to, 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 to 
um, to increase the the size of the community of the people that are interesting interested in uh, the developments, the technical developments of the graph. So if you have any questions or any suggestions, you have a place where you can visit and uh, uh, provide them. Uh, so in any case, keep this slide and uh, it contains a lot of useful pointers for people that are trying to use the graph for the first time. Of course, if uh, all this sounds interesting, um, feel free to perform local experiments on your computer. Uh, based on the beginner's kit and uh, you can find more information about uh, the beginner's kit in the previous uh, graph community call as I mentioned uh, that uh, Miriam uh, presented everything uh, in a lot of details you can find the recording and uh, the respective slides uh, online and I have included pointers to that in my slides so that uh, for your convenience and before uh, closing, I, ah, uh, before going away, I would like to say that uh, there in this um, uh, particular uh, community call, you will see uh, also uh, various examples on how you can write some queries in a notebook and uh, perform an analysis uh, using this notebook uh, on the graph data using the beginner's kit. Uh, Miriam was presenting this in a lot of detail, so uh, it is a very good uh, starting point uh, for you to see uh, different examples of queries on the graph that are of interest and that can be used as they are or variations of them uh, in particular types of analysis using the graph. Of course, something uh, final to say. Uh, the APIs are good uh, for someone that would like to, to get uh, focused uh, information about a couple of publications or things like that. But if someone would like to perform a full analysis, uh, then uh, using the full data set uh, would be preferable. Okay, and before uh, closing this uh, presentation that I was trying to, to, to provide you different perspectives on how the graph can be useful and uh, uh, to, to help you identify maybe use cases that uh, you could test. Uh, before closing this presentation and giving the mic to you for uh, discussion, uh, I have to include it here to indicative applications of the opener graph uh, that we already, um, that are providing useful services to researchers and other stakeholders. The first one is of course, opener monitor. I'm sure that most of you already know about the service. Uh, so the Open Air Monitor is using all this data that we mentioned from the graph uh, to produce uh, even more uh, indicators and graphs and visualizations that can provide useful insights uh, for research performing organizations, for funders, uh, for some initiatives like, for instance, research infrastructures to uh, get some insights about the production uh, that they have, uh, the uptake uh, that they have to open science practices uh, or uh, the citation-based impact of this work, things like that, but also others, uh, other indicators. Um, and uh, similarly, there is another application, again, based on another open air uh, service which is called the Open Science Observatory and uh, focusing on Europe uh, you can see there uh, you can monitor um, different um, uh, data different uh, facts about uh, the scientific production from the organizations that come from a particular country um, so this is also being uh, calculated and supported uh, based on the graph. Uh, these are two of the open air services. All of them under the hood, they have uh, the open air graph. For instance, there is also Explore that is focusing on helping people in scientific discovery. Uh, so uh, these are real uh, life uh, applications uh, of the graph being used uh, in practice. And uh, with that being said, I would like to thank you for your interest. Until now, I will be open uh, for discussion about uh, anything that you would like to ask. Uh, but uh, even if uh, you are silent now or 
uh, you think of something uh, at a later point, uh, you can uh, contact me uh, via my email at Opener uh, or via my social media. Thank you again. Thank you, Tanasis. Uh, we have already some questions. Uh, Robert is asking if uh, is it uh, or it will be possible to keep in sync with the full graph. Uh, for example, um, through a last modified date uh, call on the API or regular snapshot like uh, possible with uh, Crossref. Okay, okay. Uh, so currently, uh, the graph data are being updated more or less once uh, each month. Uh, so once each month, more or less, uh, we have a new version of the graph that is being produced based on updated information that we get from the uh, input sources. Now, um, the full uh, graph dump, the, the, the full graph data set, um, is being released openly once it's six months. Uh, so we don't provide uh, the full data set uh, each time that we are calculating a new version of the graph. However, first of all, uh, every uh, new version is accessible via uh, the opener services and the APIs. So someone that would be interested to get the most recent information, they can use the APIs. And uh, I'm sure that uh, um, for people that would like to use the data sets, the full data sets in a more frequent uh, way, uh, OpenAir, as far as I know, uh, is open to provide uh, these data sets more frequently uh, in, in a service uh, mode, so after a particular agreement. Uh, I think this is something that is possible to, to happen. Now, uh, the second part of this uh, question, I think, is related to the fact that each time that we are publishing um, the data set, uh, there is no easy way for someone to identify the differences. Uh, so currently, uh, for technical uh, reasons, we are not supporting uh, the differences. Uh, also, we have in our uh, our mission, let's say, is to try to provide at each point a, a good representation of the information that is available out there, not to keep the, the whole history of the different objects, of uh, the different uh, data sources, etc. Uh, so um, we are keeping uh, the different versions of the graph out there, but we are not providing a diff from version to version right now. And I'm not sure that something like this will be supported very soon. But uh, of course, if we have a lot of such uh, requests, we can discuss it again, maybe inside the forum, uh, and see if uh, we can prioritize this as a possible change for the future. Um, I, I hope that I have answered every aspect of this question. Thanks, Tanasis. Uh, yes, also in the chat is confirmed. Uh, that uh, you answered. Uh, so we have another question coming uh, from uh, Ivo. Uh, do you also have uh, field normalized uh, citation indicators uh, like uh, CNCI or FWCI, like uh, Clarivate or uh, uh, Elsevier? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, this is something that we have in our plans. So currently we are not offering, for instance, for instance FWCI, uh, which is a field-weighted citation index. Uh, it is possible to, to get this type of indicators uh, if there is an interest for them. Uh, I understand why someone would like to use uh, one such indicator, but at least uh, for time being, what we have selected was uh, to provide um, uh, something similar to that not completely the same, but something similar. Uh, so uh, we are using um, the different fields and uh, we are calculating um, the percentile into which uh, each of the publications um, 
belongs uh, for a particular indicator, let's say for a citation count. Uh, we are providing a class together with uh, the indicator, um, which is uh, saying that, okay, this publication uh, based on citation count is in the top 1% or 10% or something like that. And uh, um, I do not remember if we have included this in the graph already, but at least uh, for the source that we are using for this type of indicators, the big database, uh, there at least it is included, and maybe also in the graph, uh, a, a field-based uh, percentile. So this means that although we are not providing uh, the respective number, um, normalized based on the size of the respective domain, uh, we are providing an indication uh, so that you can uh, someone could uh, um, understand, uh, could get an insight about what does this number mean inside the respective domain based on the percentile that you can find for this article. Now again, I should check again if we include this type of nor um, of uh, field-based uh, classes inside the graph. They are sure part of the uh, BIPTB, uh, but even if they are not currently part of the graph, uh, we could easily arrange to include them in a next release. And of course, as I said, also calculating a field-weighted citation index is something that is not very difficult for us, since we are already doing similar type of analysis uh, on the whole citation network. Uh, it is easy uh, relatively easy uh, to normalize uh, this course based on the respective field. So if we have a lot of interest for that, this is something that we can uh, provide uh, during the next period. And again, before closing this uh, answer, I would like to mention again the importance of the forum. So if you have requests like this and you feel like uh, a such addition would be really nice to have, uh, you have a place uh, to write about them. We are there to hear you and uh, to prioritize, uh, for example, the development of the graph based on what uh, the community seems to, to need. Thank you, Tenasis. We have uh, other three questions in the chat. Um, can open air be considered as an alternative to Web of Science for uh, searching research uh, metrics? This is the first one. Yeah, let me answer that. Yes. Uh, also, this is the whole point uh, behind the Barcelona Declaration that uh, uh, you can use open resources like the open air as alternatives. Uh, of course, we have done a lot of discussion with people that are experts in the field and uh, there are various things to, to consider. Um, Web of Science, uh, in terms of coverage, I think that uh, open air is very... Uh, close uh, to, to the respective uh, closed sources. Uh, in some cases, uh, you can also find things that you cannot find there uh, based on different types of contributions, for instance, uh, or based on uh, uh, gray literature that is not included there. Uh, but what sometimes is important for people um, that are performing uh, analysis like Scientometrics uh, is to, to exclude, for instance, to, to make sure that uh, the data that they are using uh, are not, for instance, including uh, uh, publications from predatory publishers and things like that. So one point is that uh, one difference that the Open Air Graph and other open initiatives, not only the Open Air Graph, all the open initiatives, uh, do not have a policy on what is being included in terms of uh, publishers. Uh, so in theory, uh, in Web of Science, uh, someone could uh, take also into, uh, uh, take uh, not uh, to, to have the benefit uh, to know that whatever was included in the Web of Science uh, was from a publisher that at least had a particular set of uh, guarantees given to Web of Science. Now, this is, has a lot of discussion, and this is an ongoing discussion relevant uh, to initiatives like the Barcelona uh, Declaration. Um, 
the fact that you have a gatekeeper uh, that is a company to me it, uh, is something counterintuitive for something that should be a community driven approach we are discussing about how we can have something similar based on the community of researchers uh, that there is out there uh, but um, also uh, since everything that we are providing in is transparent and someone could see uh, the different sources it is very uh, easy very easy it is possible for people that were performing, performing the respective analysis to apply some filters before uh, doing uh, their stuff and actually uh, this is the way that this thing worked in uh, the past uh, for different types of use cases. Maybe you have heard uh, that there is the Leiden uh, metrics, uh, the, the, the Leiden rankings uh, out there for universities. And uh, they have uh, recently released a version uh, that is not using uh, closed sources, but open ones. And to do so, uh, they had to perform, of course, a first uh, filtering step. Uh, to make sure that based on the um, requirements that they have for their analysis that can be different based on the use case and only the researcher, the analyst, knows about what to use, uh, they could filter out uh, some content that was not relevant uh, for them or that they could not trust this much. Uh, so to summarize the, the answer, uh, in general, yes, uh, the opener graph uh, is a very rich uh, provider of uh, scholarly information. They contain a lot of information. It is transparently produced and it provides provenance so you can uh, do any gatekeeping you want uh, when you are using it as an input to your analysis. In, ter in terms of coverage, also it is very close uh, to the closed sources. It provides a lot of things pre-computed uh, like uh, Scopus or Web of Sci Science is doing as well. And, uh, okay, the, the, the default version is free, uh, which is also important. Uh, the, gra the full graph and the APIs are free of use, and you can have access to this information without uh, paying something. Um, and, of course, you can find inside there a lot of stuff that you cannot find in Web of Science because it's focusing on publications, and also on publications uh, based on uh, journals. Uh, for some domains, this is a problem because, for instance, from this computer science domain that I'm coming from, a lot of people are uh, publishing original research, peer-reviewed original research in conferences. Uh, this is the publishing system that we have. Uh, and That's in many true. cases, in such uh, resources, you cannot find this. Uh, we need uh, to wrap up uh, the community call. Ah, okay. Uh I didn't know we have a time limit. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a uh, one hour time. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, will, a pity. we will have, uh, uh, we will answer to the remaining questions that are here in the chat uh, in uh, our note that was published at the beginning of the chat. Uh, but you can also find the information in uh, uh, the Open Air website. You go to support community calls and uh, uh, you search for the uh, open air community call um, of the graph and uh, here you will find uh, the recording of the previous calls uh, and uh, the notes uh, including also the uh, questions that are here in any case you can uh, uh, use the um, open air graph user forum uh, that was posted here in the chat as well uh, to ask more questions and uh, have our answer uh, so the next uh, community call will be uh, the one of uh, Monitor uh, next week. Uh, and we will uh, speak about the uh, specific indicators that we have in the open air uh, uh, graph uh, and the, in the open air dashboards. Uh, so uh, see you for uh, all the people that are uh, uh, looking uh, for the open air uh, graph specific calls uh, next month. Uh, or next week, if you are more interested in the indicators. Uh, thank you so much and have a nice day. Bye. Thanks.